It's Thursday, November 29th. The groundbreaking ceremony for the Kartarpur Corridor that will enable visa-free travel for Sikh pilgrims to the iconic Gurdwara Darbar Sahib on the Pakistan end had Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan and Army Chief Kamar Javed Bajwa in attendance. Sharing the stage with them were ministers from the Modi cabinet. The Kartarpur Corridor has been spoken of by some as having the potential to transform Indo-Pakistan relations. But External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj was clear the corridor and bilateral dialogue are two different things. It was me only who started the comprehensive bilateral dialogue, she said. But what happened after that? Pathan Court. What happened after that? Uri. So we had to take the big picture. Swaraj made clear that India was not responding positively to Pakistan's invitation to Prime Minister Modi to visit the country for the SARC summit, saying, unless and until Pakistan stops terrorism activities in India, there will be no dialogue and we will not participate in SARC. Meanwhile, early Wednesday morning, a lashkar e taiba terrorist, Naveed Jhat, accused of killing senior journalist Shujaat Bukhari, was shot dead by security forces in Bargam. He was reportedly from Multan in Pakistan. Outgoing Chief Election Commissioner O.P. Rawat has raised questions about the Modi government's scheme to reduce corruption in political funding, electoral bonds. Electoral bonds are simple money instruments that any Indian citizen can buy from the State Bank of India and then hand over to a political party of their choice during specific 15-day windows. Now, the government insisted that because you have to purchase such bonds by check and through the banking system, the money coming in is likely to be white and not black. But under the electoral bonds scheme, neither the person buying the bonds nor the political party that receives it would have to disclose the identity of the bond purchaser. This essentially means donations to political parties can be completely anonymous. The amendment in Section 29C of the Representation of People Act 1951 makes it no longer necessary to report details of donations received through electoral bonds. Contribution reports of political parties need not mention names and addresses, etc., of those contributing by way of electoral bonds. And since parties don't have to file details of contributions received in this manner, the Commission will not know of it and will in turn not be able to display it on their website as they had been doing for people to know. The government also amended rules that had earlier said companies could only donate up to 7.5% of their average net profit over the previous three years. This rule ensured that shell companies were not being established merely to funnel money into politics. But the Modi government's amendments did away with this. Another amendment removed the requirement for firms to declare their political contributions on their profit and loss statements. Altogether, as researcher Milan Vaishnav put it, far from reducing opacity in how politics is financed, this new vehicle merely legitimizes it. The Election Commission thought so too, telling the government in December 2017 that it was a retrograde step. Before, a new CEC suddenly announced that it was a step towards the right direction. Now, O.P. Rawat has waded in as well, saying, while we have not done a full assessment yet, prima facie, I feel that none of our concerns have been addressed in the electoral bonds scheme notified on the 2nd of January. Actually, there are many grey areas in this because when there is no ceiling on party expenditure and the EC cannot monitor it, how can you be sure that what is coming in is not black money as there is a secrecy of the donor? Even foreign money can come, and even a dying company can give money now because the clause that insisted that only companies with a minimum 7.5% profit in the last three years could donate has been removed. The electoral bond scheme has been challenged in the Supreme Court. The matter is still pending. So, what's the first word that comes to your mind when we mention 
Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba, the world's ninth most valuable company worth $400 billion. What about when we mention this guy, Alibaba's founder and China's richest man, Jack Ma? Staunchly communist? Not exactly, right? Which is exactly why news that the English teacher turned Chinese billionaire internet icon has been a member of the Chinese Communist Party for years now has surprised many. It's not just the money. Worth $37 billion, Ma isn't a faceless business leader as those of state-owned PetroChina or China Mobile. He's everywhere, doing the moonwalk dressed as Michael Jackson, singing in a three-foot feather mohawk at a company party, and playing a superhero in advertisements. Let's just say the communist's favorite trait, austere, doesn't quite describe him. We're not sure how long Ma has been a member of the party, but he's always fiercely defended it. Even as it suppresses media and internet freedom, Ma has gone on record to say he was prepared to share information about his customers with authorities, reports the BBC. He has repeatedly praised the stability of China's one-party rule, chastised American companies complaining about entering the Chinese market, saying, if they come here, they have to say, OK, I follow Chinese rules and laws. Ma is one of approximately 88 million people who are supposed to pay monthly dues, attend regular meetings and sometimes submit themselves to self-criticism to improve their ideological understanding, reported the BBC. Along with him, the Communist Party as part of a celebration marking 40 years since the country's economic reform will own 100 prominent actors, sportspersons, business heads, including Tencent chief Pony Ma and Baidu CEO Robin Lee. The names beg the question, how capitalist is China's Communist Party, really? An 18-year-old from Jorhat in Assam schooled US President Donald Trump on climate change in a tweet that has now gone viral. On Washington temperatures dipping to minus 2 degrees Celsius on the 21st of November, Trump, a documented climate change skeptic, tweeted, Brutal and extended cold blast could shatter old records. Whatever happened to global warming? To this, the teenager, Asta Sarma, replied, I am 54 years younger than you. I just finished high school with average marks. But even I can tell you that weather is not climate. If you want help understanding that, I can lend you my encyclopedia from when I was in second grade. It has pictures and everything. NASA described climate change as a long-term shift in temperature averages as opposed to short-term weather events. Dr. J. Marshall Shepard, president of the American Meteorological Society, helpfully described it as, weather is your mood and climate is your personality. The cold blast or cold wave is what a region experiences due to what is described as a seasonable polar vortex episode. What that essentially means is that even if the Earth's temperature or the region's climate is heating up, a cold blast that is a stream of cold air from the pole surges into the warmer region, creating a difference in pressure which results in precipitation, in this case snow and chills. The phenomenon is independent of the climate of the region. Trump's tweet comes just after former Vice President Al Gore lashed out to the Trump administration saying, Unbelievably deadly and tragic wildfires rage in the West. Hurricanes batter our coasts and the Trump administration chooses the Friday after Thanksgiving to try and bury a critical U.S. assessment of the climate crisis. That's it for today. We'll join you tomorrow, no matter what the weather. Love your morning fix? Help support our journalism. Subscribe to Scroll Plus using the link in the description.